Welcome to Sleepless in St. Canard, where nostalgia replaces REM cycles. I'm Kitty. And I'm Ange. And we haven't slept in 30 years. This is a podcast about the 90s classic cartoon Darkwing Duck, which first hit syndicated airwaves on September 6, 1991, which means, as our regular intro suggests, this marks 30 foul, nega diapered, Hawaiian shirt bedecked, banana brained, liquidated, macabre, keen geared, shushed, slime fried, bush rooted, and last but not least, dangerous years, which is a heck of an anniversary, I must say. To commemorate this, Ange and I have decided to do something a little different, a little spicier, and a little holier, perhaps, than our usual fare, and do a deep dive into the coveted and highly secretive Darkwing Duck Show Bible. So now, if you would all please rise and join us in singing the hymn on page eight, Hope Rests Upon Muddle Footing. Uh, no. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what we're going to do today. <laughs> Is it September 6th or September 8th? You know what? There was one site that I checked that said the 7th. Everything else I saw was the 6th. Oh, I am a terrible fan. I have it down as the 8th, I think. Oh, you're correct. Okay, so for some reason it lists September 6th for the episode list, and then for some reason the first air date on, like, the main part of this, like the original release, is the 8th, which is confusing. You know what? I think it might be because September 6th, their airing it of it was, like, a special. Mm. So it was the hour-long parts one and two of Darkly Dawn Duck. And then, like, Mickey Mouse goes back to school or something along those lines. Because Labor Day weekend, which is generally the first weekend in September, marks, like, the kids go back to school that week. That maybe, like, this was, like, the Saturday, you know, or whatever day it was in 1991. It's like, here's the show! And then it went into regular syndication a couple days later, maybe. Ah. Well, if it is the 6th, then that is the day we'll be posting this and the day that you will be probably listening to it unless you listen to it retroactively which means i have the day off because it is labor day on the 6th same Woohoo! look at that and we don't have to go back to school anymore because uh as previously mentioned we are old as dirt so the show bible and would you like to explain to the people what a show bible is i will to the best of my ability i suspect we might get some corrections on this if i am not technically correct But my understanding from animation knowledge is that it's a Bible is basically put together for the writers and the folks working on the show. And it just sort of walks them through the style of the writing and the characters. And it's it's usually put together by the person who created the show. So in this case, it was Tad Stones. And it would introduce the setting. It'll talk about the main characters and some important aspects of their personality and it will have a lot of notes for the writers like keep in mind when you're writing this about this character don't do this or do this instead and I think even some show bibles might have possibly like character design information too like with the Powerpuff Girls it's like don't ever draw them on the profile because they look like horrific terrifying aliens if they're completely <laughs> side on so you're never supposed to draw the powerpuff girls completely profile which is balloons with eyeballs yes they look terrifying so <laughs> that's essentially what it is and originally the darkwing duck show bible like most disney property is not supposed to be seen by the public it is locked down Everybody has to sign non-disclosure agreements. They're not supposed to talk about the stuff and they're not supposed to share it. But as is the way of the internet, people get their hands on this stuff. They scan it and they leak it out onto the internet and it's too late. You can't take it back. And so the show Bible actually only hit the internet a few years ago. I remember because I was constantly wondering, is there a Darkwing Duck show Bible? And then it turned out, I think, my understanding was that some mysterious person was selling it on eBay. And by which I mean selling on eBay, they were just selling like photocopies of mm-hmm. the papers. They're probably, they probably have their own copy still. And so somebody, I don't know who, I can't even remember, purchased it off eBay and then they just scanned it and they shared it with everybody. It just spread across the internet. So yeah, we can look at this and it is very interesting because it shows a few important things but also I don't know if you noticed this kitty but 
It will have notes about stuff for the characters that I feel they didn't follow through with in the show. A little bit, yeah. A little bit of that Uh here and there, but there's also just confirmation of certain things, like Morgana's last name. Mm. Forever, people were like, how do you spell macabre? Mm. Like, what way is it spelled? And it confirms in the show Bible that her name was spelled M-A-C-A-W-B-E-R. Like the bird. Yeah, like the macaw. So now we officially know that is 100% her correct spelling, because, yeah, I've seen many different variations on her last name and arguments and stuff like that but you know nothing about whether or not she has legs <laughs> and no there's there's no information about that in there at all but yeah this it, it is fun to look at this because it is heavily heavily photocopied so there are certain words that just kind of vanish and like the dark parts of it like the d and the dark wing Looks like somebody took some white out to it in spots. But the very first page is this big old, you are not to give this material to anyone without the permission of the supervising producer or Mickey Mouse and goddamn self. (laughs) So uh, I don't know who you are, but I salute you, soldier. I hope the Mouse's lawyers will never know your betrayal. And if you've already been serving time that, you know, if you have to mop up, uh, it's a small world every night. I appreciate your your, uh, your sacrifice. They are vigilante in their own right. It's true. So, yeah, so on the on the cover here, it says written by Tad Stones. And I thought this was interesting, too, that it says, you know, revisions, March 26, 1991. So there are points in this document where... They list what episodes the characters have already appeared in. Mm-hmm. So I would think that was probably where the revisions took place. But we don't know. It's not a Google Doc. It's a physical document. You can't look back and see the alteration history. So uh, we can dive right in here. So the first page of this lovely document uh, just kind of is the the basic premise of the show. Talking about you know Darkwing and his relation to folks but anytime there's a new character or location or gadget name dropped it's all in caps and I can't stop my brain from interpreting it as someone just screaming (laughs) like Darkwing Duck stores his gadgets (laughs) in Darkwing Tower where he parks his Honda Civic on during business hours is his own problem. So, you know, to that extent, something like that. So there's lots of launch pad McQuack. Goslin. It, it tickles me. It tickles me. I'm a little used to it from reading show scripts. That's how they do it. They tend to, any kind of location or name of a character, they put it in caps, I guess, just to catch your attention. Your mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. So it does in this um, opening paragraph here, it, it kind of confirms things. I don't really know. They probably do go into it in the show, but we get the name drop of Audubon Bay Bridge, which I, I feel like it's probably said in the show maybe once or twice. It is, for sure, because I, yeah. I think there was an episode where they say, gasp, the Audubon Bay Bridge, because something is happening to it at one point. It's It's pretty funny. Because they're just kind of, or I guess it's Tad. Tad is just kind of dragging Darkwing through the whole thing. <laughs> um, it, one of those sentences in particular I, I highlighted. It says, The life of Darkwing Duck, a.k.a. Drake Ballard, is hopelessly complicated with his adoption of Goslin. Like, hopelessly complicated? It seems, seems a little harsh. <laughs> like, what does hopelessly complicated mean? There was one part that I liked. Let's see if I can find it. It was, it was, I think it had to do with the plot. Okay, it was in the plot section. Now get him in his hat and cape as soon as possible and frustrate him whenever you can. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And then uh, the technical devices should be funny in themselves or end up making things harder for our hero, not easier. So he's just really the bane of his own existence. And then and as far as like, I'm still page one. You're flipping ahead. <laughs> but Darkwing Duck is a comedy adventure series that combines the warmth and emotion of traditional Disney storytelling with a wild and broad execution of classic cartoon short subjects. And I thought that was interesting 
because it does to an extent like it has like those warm happy moments with goslin and drake but there are certain you know parts of the show that are not typical disney <laughs> so it's just kind of solidified in that one statement there that it's like we want a dash of disney and then you know here's negative with a gun <laughs> So it's a weird hodgepodge of Di- Disney mentality and the the zaniness of what Darkwing Duck is actually on screen. And that's why um, I gravitated towards it as a child, because I really like that kind of gallows humor, I think mm-hmm. would be the term. Like there's that, it's funny, but at the same time, there's a lot of humor in the show that when you actually think about it, it's like, wow, that's dark. And I just love that stuff as a kid. And mm-hmm. I just... I think that's why it's probably why I got so pulled into the universe and I'm so invested in all the characters is because of that vibe. The dynamic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good. And and I feel like it helps it stand up too because it's not just, you know, the 90s feel good. Here's a moral. Here's another moral. Here's another moral. And look how nice every parent is to their kids. It's just kind of like, why does anybody put up with this guy? Oh, but look, he learned his lesson and he won the day. And sometimes I don't even feel like he really learned a lesson. But yeah, it was interesting. I liked I liked that. And then also we get a, a glimpse of, of Launchpad in this opening page here where he's referred to as staunch but often clueless. <laughs> and you know what? Big mood. Big mood, Launchpad McQuack. I'm sorry, Launchpad McQuack! <laughs> Yeah, and then after that, we go down into the main cast breakdowns, where basically it just, you know, describes the Darkwing that we all know and love, and sometimes are super frustrated by, where basically he is very talented, and he, he can, you know, cut the mustard as far as crime fighting goes, but he just gets in his own way with his own personality and his own character flaws. In fact, the fun of most episodes is in setting him up for the fall by letting him get cocky hitting him with a major catastrophe, then picking up the pieces. And that's basically rinse and repeat method in here. There's also a quite a bit of Tad just kind of riffing, like, examples of dialogue and stuff like that. He gives a whole list of I am the terror speeches, like, that could be finished, and they're they're pretty fun. And he again, he kind of just solidifies what is going on. He's going to be terrible he's going to be insensitive to people but then he will eventually realize that he did wrong and try to do the right thing and then that's when the episode turns around and he's actually able to win the day we it's all... very interesting because it yeah. is it's a formula yeah. they basically created Mm-hmm. yeah it's just like we just do this every time just have him be terrible and then he'll you know something happens he'll come around and there we go. Put a bow on it. It's done. I like the I am the terrors. I particularly liked I am the penalty for early withdrawal. Dot, dot, <laughs> dot. That's what she said. Hey. hey. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely a few things in there and I'm like, phrasing? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and then they talk about how Darkwing doing his own self-narration is just kind of a captain's log scenario from Star Trek. And they go into his civilian identity, Drake Mallard. And, of course, we need to talk about the first mention of my family from another pond. Well-meaning but maddening neighbors, the Muddlefoots. (laughs) And then the next line is, he has no job other than being Darkwing Duck. We never explain how he pays his bills, although some episodes suggest that the international peacekeeping organization Shush supplies him with high-tech equipment and trade for his occasional services. So, Drake Mallard, unemployed man of the people, hates the Muddlefoots. He's also an adrenaline junkie. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That was the next thing I had highlighted. (laughs) Who is completely intolerant of bureaucracy. There's a lot of super outdated examples in here. Like, and the L.A. Times ads that come on before the movie. I've never been to L.A., so I don't know if there's still L.A. Times ads in front of movies. Yeah, I don't know. I can't, we can Someone from imagine. California, please tell us, if you're in the Los Angeles area, <laughs> are there still L.A. Times ads that come on before movies in the theater? 
inquiring minds want to know. And then that's it for our initial swing at Darkwing, and then we're on to, to Launchpad. And as they talk about each character, there is a drawing of them. Mm -hmm. Launchpads is very Launchpad. Kind of looks like he's in the middle of doing the YMCA dance. But very early on in his description, it says he is a co-star, not the lead. So it better not be right in Launchpad episodes <laughs> or Thaddeus Stone is going to come to your house and, I don't know, make you watch LA Times ads. Have some very stern words for you. Exactly. And he's also considered the sympathetic caretaker, which I guess could apply to either Drake or Goslin, <laughs> <laughs> since he kind of mothers them both a little bit. He's also described as being a big, naive kid with the openness and trust of a toddler. This makes him the conscience of Darkwing Duck. It's funny because it reminds me of how nowadays people don't like it when you infantilize. Is that how you pronounce it? Infantilize? I'll allow it. <laughs> when you infantilize characters by taking adult characters and being like, oh, they're such a little baby, they're such a little bee, and they're such a little cinnamon bun. But they're actually doing that with Launchpad. They're like, he has the emotional makeup of a child. He is just a giant baby in the form of a man. <laughs> <laughs> they, they really do. And I feel like it's in Goslin's section where he, where he drags him a little bit more. He's saying that Goslin is intellectually superior <laughs> to him. But she doesn't consider him stupid. So... That's very nice. But then it says, Goslin can double talk launch pad fairly easily. Of course, so can cottage cheese. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in this section too, we also get a, a snippet of what their interactions should be like. And it's a really kind of terrible example where Drake is complaining about how he doesn't want to go on a date with yes. some girl. Gert, her name is. And then Launchpad is be like, oh, you, you know, you should be nice to her. And kind of guilt trips Drake into taking her. His last line is, maybe I could wear a disguise. So, Gert, you stay strong, girl. All right? You don't need Drake Mallard in your life. Yeah, just geez. Be super, super mean to you. Yeah, he, he's, his exact words are, I don't care if it hurts her feelings. There's no way I'm going to be seen on a date with her. <laughs> Like, who's this poor Gert, and why is she so badly rejected by him? <laughs> it's just... And why is that your example, Tad? <laughs> is this a show about superheroes? And the other's like, you know what? What if he has to go on a date with someone who is... I don't even know. We don't know what Gert's failings are. And maybe her failing is, is that she wants to go on a date with Drake. <laughs> it's, her, it's her one flaw. LP is a constant source of frustration, but loyal. Oh yes, to Darkwing. Yeah, and sarcasm doesn't affect him because he doesn't understand it. <laughs> also, there's a, a lot of examples of how he is domestically, and it's like when a bomb turns their property into a smoldering crater, he's the first one to point out that their crabgrass problems are over. So kind of, I guess, confirming that Launchpad does live at the house. Yeah, and I always figured he did. He's also considered something of an idiot savant, heavy on the idiot. <laughs> My god, Ted. Yeah, and of course, he's, his motto remains, any crash you can walk away from is a good one. It's, it's very good. It's a good motto to have. So that's our, our glimpse into the idiot savant, heavy on the idiot Launchpad. And then we are on to Goslin, which I think is one of my least favorite stock pictures they use of her, where she's pulling on her pigtails. Oh, yeah. Where, like, they're down to her crotch, basically, and she's just crossing her eyes and sticking her tongue out, and uh, it's just rude. Goslin, not like the other girls, Mallard. I know, <laughs> and it's, it kind of annoys me. Like, it's the tone of her section, I was just kind of getting a little insulted. Like she's nine years old, the perfect age to giggle about boys, join a ballet class, and graduate from Raggedy Ann to Malibu Barbie. Of course, she's not doing any of that. Like, okay. And then 
Goslin has more in common with Bill Watterson's Calvin and the little girl who usually populate the airwaves. She's very independent, probably too much so. And he kind of goes into Goslin and who she is and how she can be difficult and, you know, that she's, she's sporty and everything. And he, he's, you know, she likes comic books, movies, music, and gross things. And the next sentence is, the danger in this portrait is that Goslin could become too tough to be likable. It's her love of Drake, Launchpad, and Honker that keep her sympathetic. And it makes me sad to read about how all the traits that I love about Goslin could skew her to being unlikable. Like, to me, she was a standout, like, kid on a show that was not the typical girl character, you know, like, you know, not like other girls. But there were so few of them when the show was first on. Like, so many of them were just, like, the personality was the girl. So, like, I don't think that, like, because a lot of the stuff that she liked, with the exception of sports, I liked. So, I was like, hey, ouch. <laughs> <laughs> Take it easy on Goslin. Yeah, so danger in this portrait is that Goslin has become too tough to be likable. Keep her sympathetic, all right? And I always found kinda... her to be the most sympathetic because she was usually the one who not only calls Drake out when he's being a dick, but she tends to have a soft spot for, you know, people like Honker who are very vulnerable and shy and she gives him a chance and she doesn't just write him off as a loser and a geek and she she's like that with a lot of different characters where she's very supportive of them no matter how weird they are yeah like stigma and i'm sure there's more but i can't think of <laughs> but i like i feel like she is she is a far more i don't know if likable is the right word but i feel like she's she's a better balanced character than drake is because she does have that empathetic side and she is very loyal and accepting you know, even with Darkwing. Like, she accepted him from the jump. Like, oh, you're a superhero? Cool. I like that stuff. And, you know, I don't know. I really, I just really, really like Goslin. And then he does go on to say, when Goslin finally has her first real date, Drake will either act as a heavily armed chaperone or have to be sedated. So, which do you think? Well, I was going to say that in this day and age, most people don't really like the stereotype of the crazy, overprotective, overbearing father who hates, you know, the son-in-law or whoever the love interest is. But I'm going to say that in all fairness, if there was any character in the world and any father character in the world who would act as a heavily armed chaperone or have to be sedated, it would absolutely be Drake because that is his personality. <laughs> they probably in that exact order, too. <laughs> He's so heavily armed that he needs to be sedated. <laughs> Other than that, maybe he would just be like, oh, you're taking her on a date? Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> and then he'd get decked. Oh, yeah, and then he closes out basically with the sentiment that Drake loves Goslin very much. He does, and we do know when he's not being terrible to her. I actually thought and it was then... interesting that they said in Darkwing Duck's section, it keeps him from being as sensitive to the feelings of others as he should be, especially to his daughter, Goslin. So they yeah. emphasize that he's incredibly insensitive, but even Goslin isn't safe from his personality. Yeah, it, it kind of makes it seem like the conflict with Goslin is what they would prefer. Yeah, and I didn't get that vibe often. When it did come up in an episode, it was usually the two of them being really competitive against one another, mm -hmm. and it was it was mutual. The wh Whiffle While You Work is the episode that comes to mind where I recall them both being very competitive. And of course, anytime she's quivering quack too, Drake mm -hmm. gets very salty about that. But for the most part, I thought he had a softer spot for her compared to a lot of other characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was thinking immediately my mind went to Wiffle While You Work. Because it's literally just them <laughs> <laughs> versus each other. And then Quacker Jack coming in and Quacker Jacking it up. But he's uh, pretty rude to her in that episode. Mm -hmm. Then we have our next little section here about Darling Boy Honker. He's so cute in his picture. He's sitting down and he's looking kind of sad. And it is canon, according to the show Bible, 
and he has the firmest grip on reality. <laughs> I'm gonna take that as the whole show because <laughs> it seems it seems like a fair statement to say. And then just reading his section here kind of made me sad because it talks about why Hunker is the way that he is. It's actually quite sad. <laughs> yeah. He's like, the struggle for parental approval and the risk of being pounded by his brother instilled in Honker an abnormal fear of making mistakes. Oh, Honker. Well, Honker's lack of self-confidence rises from the lack of support from his parents. They worry that he's too bookish. And they encourage Honker to be normal. More like his brother. <laughs> his, his tank is normal. And also he talks about his friendship with Goslin, and that there's a one-sided puppy love affair between Honker and Goslin, and she has no idea. I never got uh, that vibe then... from the show. Like, I know that there's maybe, like, one point in the show, I want to say it is it's the episode with that creepy purple alien, and he calls Goslin his Conker's girlfriend or something like that, or he makes a comment that, that you know what I'm talking about, Wacko, the alien. Oh, will I never be rid of you and your irritating boyfriend? What? And I don't actually. That does not. I, I'm sure it is. I, I do not. I'm not doubting it, but I don't recall. It's the purple alien with the collar episode. I can't believe I forgot the name of it. I usually know like every episode name off by heart, but this one is. Yeah. I think it's when aliens collide. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. It's, it sounds like the type. And then it goes on to talk about Launchpad and he idolizes him. And like it was like oh I, I I kind of always knew that they were they were cool but reading this it just kind of warmed my heart a little bit. Honker idolizes Launchpad as a boy might a supportive protective older brother. He provides the adult approval that Honker never gets from his parents, and this is what makes you know ingrains Honker into the Darkwing Duck family. Which, can I just say that the Darkwing Duck fandom really does Honker dirty? They leave him out of everything. And they make fun of him all the time, and they just treat him as, like, the grossest character ever. And he doesn't deserve it. Aww. Honker is a he good doesn't. kid. He's a sweetheart. I mean, he's misguided in sections, but who wouldn't be? But for the most part, he's a pretty solid dude. Yeah, I find people treat him, like, almost like a threat to something, and I don't even know what. I don't know. People don't seem to like Honker very much. Maybe that it's just because of the potential implication that he could be a love interest for Goslin, and people don't like that. I don't know. But I just find that he, he often, he's the butt of jokes, and people tend to frame him as like almost like a creepy type, kind of like Bushroot. Oh, that's unfair. Poor little Honker. He's a good kid. See, he, he's not me. guys... He doesn't get approval from his parents, and he's not getting it from you either. How dare you? He d then Tad says, some notes of caution about Honker. Do not play him as a geek or nerd. He is not an inventor. And then he goes on to talk about how he wouldn't be basically like the gyro of this show. And then finally, which I had never thought before, says, finally, though he is chubby, do not write fat jokes. I never read I Honker as being chubby. Me either. He's got like that, he, he's just a little duckling. He's got that duckling kind of body. Like Tank is definitely heavy, but I was like, oh, well, I'm glad that there's a note in there for no fad jokes. Poor little Honker. He doesn't read like Doofus, where Doofus definitely reads as like a walking fat joke in his design yeah. and personality. But Honker, I never got that impression. Yeah. So... Yeah, so that's our little section on Honker. I did notice, and I thought this was interesting, they mentioned he has memory issues, that he's a walking encyclopedia with every other page missing. But I didn't really notice that in the show. Yeah, I don't think so either. Unless it's like a punchline, you know, like where he's saying something and then Drake is doing it. And it turns out to be, you know, like, oh, but don't do that right now because you could melt your eyebrows off or something. <laughs> but... I, I don't I don't know any specific examples of that. And then we have secondary cast. And the secondary cast, the first section is of course my favorite. But the picture that is there has been photocopied into oblivion. <laughs> so it's just like the top of her head next to Binky's hair. <laughs> and then like parts of the boys. Uh, and then he opens up with a outdated reference that I like looked up. 
that the Muddlefoot family makes Ozzy and Harriet's clan look like a street gang, except for Tank, who is a street gang. I'm like, I feel like I know the names Ozzy and Harriet, but apparently it was a sitcom that involved a real family. They played themselves, which aired in the 50s through 66. Hmm. Very pure kind of leave it to beaver type thing. And uh, he describes both Binky and Herb as they're oblivious to the distractions of reality. <laughs> Accurate. And they are the masters of understatement. Also accurate. <laughs> like for instance, when a villain blew up their house, Herb's only comment to Binky would be a mildly accusing, "Uh, hun, did you leave tin foil in the microwave again?" <laughs> Have you ever done that? Have you ever had like? I didn't. Like, uh... But when I was in university, my first year living in a dorm, there was like a communal microwave for our section of the floor. And somebody who clearly had their parents always cook for them and doesn't know anything about how to use microwaves put tin foil in the microwave and it created a lot of smoke. And I think they actually had to call in the fire department because I think the microwave burst into flames. <laughs> yeah, it's not great. They're forbidden fireworks. It's very pretty, but you should not do it. I did not put tin foil in the microwave, but I did put a paper plate. That was, you know, fancy. Yeah, you're not supposed to put those. Has, like, yeah, it had like the foiling on it, and it just cut out. I was like, and the microwave's on fire. <laughs> okay, we'll just leave. We'll figure this out. Okay. <laughs> so that is our PSA for this episode. Don't put tin foil in the microwave, or foiled birthday paper plates, or even those fancy plates that have any kind of shiny metallic patterns on them because we have like these christmas plates and they will spark in the microwave mm. yes real plates with fancy foiling foiling of any variety tin or otherwise yeah uh, just say no it's forbidden fireworks it looks cool watch it on youtube instead don't don't make other people's mistakes you just watch it on youtube as your god-given right in this day and age watch other people do dangerous things so there is the fun of this family is the intensity with which they try to be friendly. Like, uh, they, he gives an example of them bursting in with food and snacks to watch the Miss Universe contest that they're sure that Drake is watching and that they want to watch with him. They're painfully considerate, and they, he talks about Herb, that he is really good at his job, but the perk of his job is that he gets to work from home. So that he could stay within reach of his refrigerator and TV set. He treats everyone like a childhood buddy. And the only time that he f kind of sees the bad side of anybody is he doesn't agree with what condiments they put on their barbecue. Which, you know what? Same. Same, Herb. And then there's just... I think it's just one sentence about Binky. Yeah, she gets oh, like nothing. Yeah. <laughs> His wife, Binky, is a stereotype 50s mom who always had Kool-Aid in the refrigerator and fresh cookies in the oven. She thinks Goslin is adorable, but certainly not feminine enough. Heteronormative and I mean, Binky. That's, that's pretty much Binky in a nutshell. And she is more nuanced than that. But what else? How else can we describe Binky? Binky is well-meaning. Mm. And she is, I would say, can be more open-minded. Like... When she meets Morgana, at first she's like, they're all kind of like weirded out. But then she's like, super excited. She's like, Well, I would never have thought of adding grasshoppers to the cookie dough. Oh, I bet they're just chock full of protein. She is kind of old fashioned, but at the same time, she can be open minded. She's accepting. Mm hmm. Like, I can't see, like, I have seen people in like fanfics and stuff try to frame Herb and Binky as traditional, close-minded, homophobic neighbors. And I can't really see that because while they can be kind of old-fashioned and they do kind of push Honker in the sense that they, they're worried that he's a little too bookish and not normal, I can't see them being hateful. Yeah, I, and I don't think that it's them considering Honker that, you know, he is... I know that's what it literally says, that they wish he was more normal. But to me, I think it's just he's so different from them that they don't know how to support him the way that he needs. So they're just doing what they always do. 
and they're not exactly the characters that you look to to, to change and grow because <laughs> they're not super oh, self-aware or all that intelligent but they are very friendly they do get along with basically anyone i don't i think even when binky is a canardian guardian like she doesn't get mad she just gets slightly miffed yes <laughs> so they are very kind and accepting people you've know, got morgana as a perfect example because they do i feel like they accept morgana as she is more than drake ever does mm -hmm. and you know of course the goslin thing is a sticking point because it is the premise of a whole episode but that's just Inky mothering and i think that's another thing too that they don't go into into these two sentences is that she is a very devoted mother and she does love her sons and it's obvious that she does even though she doesn't get honker but honker is also nine like who ever knows what's going on in a nine-year-old's head <laughs> i sure don't they're little aliens why are you so mad right now what's happening here's an ice cream oh you don't like ice cream anymore okay i don't i don't know what you want but inky deserves more than two sentences in the show bible i'm gonna write at least 18 more can I just say that I really appreciate that Binky and Herb have a really healthy, loving marriage. Like, there's no point in the show where they hint that Herb is like, oh, it's my old ball and chain wife. Mm. You know, like, they're mm -hmm. very, he adores her, he worships the ground she walks on, and she adores him. And they just, there's several episodes where it shows how much they love each other. And there's no, there just isn't that traditional nagging, annoying wife and husband that kind of resents the fact that he's trapped in this marriage. Like, they're just completely happy with each other. And I always thought that was yeah. really sweet. Yeah, they seem perpetually smitten with each other. And it's adorable. There's the, in the episode, You Sweat Your Life, Nikki goes to the salon and gets her hair done and gets a new dress and everything. And Herb is just like, oh, thank you. Is that you? You look beautiful. <laughs> uh, pardon me, miss, but I was looking for my... <gasps> Binky? Why, Binky, you're prettier than a four-cheese pizza at the bowl and brain. Oh, Herb, <laughs> the things you say. That's the episode I was it's thinking so... of. <laughs> He's just so cute. And everyone, everyone should find the... Herb to their Binky or the Binky to their Herb. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. Someone who could be just as dumb as you are and still love each other. <laughs> Agreed. And then uh, our last section here on, on the Muddlefoots is Tank, and we don't really need to talk about him all too much. He gets a heck of a lot more than Binky did, that's for sure. And I feel like he's probably in less episodes than any of them. They started to write him out, bit. like, near the end of the series, they were like, well, we don't really need him that much, and he doesn't do anything, so they just kind of slowly stopped bringing him in. Yeah, and I, and as far as he goes, too, even in this, it's basically saying that there, the key is to not have him be this reoccurring like villain character for the kids because the show is about you know Darkwing, and there are actual villains to do that. We don't want to focus on the domestic life of it too much. But he is described as a lunchroom extortionist. Uh, his parents never seem to notice his behavior. And is his use is to remind the audience who he is by letting him perform some really obnoxious act and giving him his royal comeuppance. So basically, you're just supposed to be like, oh, Tank. He's just immediately in Life the Negaverse and everything, where he immediately goes to start eating Honker's birthday cake. Drake trips him, and uh, he winds up face first into the... What was it? Peanut butter? Sauerkraut. Sauerkraut. Peanut butter, sauerkraut, and honey cake. Uh, and then it goes into Goslin, and it says, Goslin is the first person to stand up to him, and she does it beautifully. That she does. Like an eternal bastion of male chauvinism, Tank can't stand the thought of her being better than he is in anything. I think that makes so, sense. Uh, Darkwing tries to avoid the Muddlefoots at all costs, but when cornered, he is polite and long-suffering. He keeps his sarcasm under his breath. And I just want to say, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> he is blatantly rude to them, to their faces, but they, like Launchpad, I feel like, 
don't know what sarcasm is. Well, even in the so in the Negaduck episode, after he's split in half, and you know Negaduck version or like Nega Drake goes out there, he's like, "Well, if it ain't the model heads, anyone ever tell you what a lousy dresser you are, Herb? Well, I paid top penny for this shirt." <laughs> <laughs> He's instantly just so sad. Poor Herb. Poor Herb. But also, if it makes it seem like Hank doesn't treat his parents that way. I don't... He's kind of rude, but I also feel like he plays, like, the, the precious little child card mm -hmm. a lot, too. So that is our far too short segment on the Muddlefoots in a secondary cast. And then uh, we get a bit of a background on Shush, wherein we see the logo... It's a pretty le neat logo. It's got, you know, shush, shush. Uh, the U seems to be made of ivy of some sort with the bird behind it. And really not too much to say about shush, only that their rivals are foul, which I still think is a fantastic anagram for a duck-related show. It's, it truly it's is. So, so clever. And then we get to uh, little Jay Gander. Jay Gander Hooter. And he is described as very English. You would like to think that he was as dashing as Darkwing when he was young. <laughs> it's another thing that said. It's like, okay. So was he? Was he was he not? Oh yeah. Uh he would be a lot less impressed if he saw how Darkwing really gets things done. And any adversarial nature between him and Grizzly Cough, he writes uh Darkwing and Grizzly Cough, he just writes it off as Grizzly Cough being jealous. And he is apparently Darkwing's biggest fan. I know, I love that. It's because he only sees the results and he doesn't see how the it's, job gets done. I mean, but he does know Darkwing. <laughs> but, you know, there are some, some wacky shush agents, so who can say? Like the perfect remedy for the by-the-book mentality of shush bureaucracy. And then, <laughs> this made me laugh, Launchpad is largely ignored by Hooter. Who's <laughs> constantly mispronouncing his name. Launch pal, launch quack, stamp pad, whatever. And then he just completely disregards the kids. He just doesn't even pay attention to them at all. So I, I kind of remember him saying launch pad's name wrong, but... I think he said lunch pail in mm. the episode where launch pad's head gets very big and terrifying as he gains psychic powers. The name of that episode escapes me at the moment. It's actually in here. I'm trying to remember what it was, because he, he specifically... I'm distracted by the mental image of Launchpad's disgusting, bulbous head. <laughs> it was one of the psychic episodes. Heavy mental. Yes. Yes. We get a very short section on Grizzly Cough, too. I really feel like he's pretty straightforward. They didn't really need to, to talk too much about him. There was one um, instance of me kind of quirking an eyebrow at the words that are used here. It says, every once in a while, Grizzly Cough accompanies Darkwing on a mission, during which he usually gets trashed. And I know that he probably means that, you know, he gets incapacitated. <laughs> but in my brain, it's just Grizzly Cough popping out the vodka. And he's getting completely oblivious. <laughs> he drinks to cope with Darkwing's incompetence. Oh my god. <laughs> I could see it. I could see it. Now that you talk about his, um, his broken English... Like, I have just received an overseas commiseration considering Darkwing Duck. Sometimes I think he is expiring against me to drive me banana splits. <laughs> uh, me too, Grizzly Cough. Gotta lay off the Shmirnoff. Uh, and then he goes on to the next segment, which is about the stories, where they talk about how a typical episode should go and that they should never get too bogged down in certain things. He does mention a few episodes by name. Uh, one of them in being Twitching Channels, which we talked about on the podcast, where he highlights Darkwing is transported to the human world where he meets his alleged quote-unquote creators. So even Tad is like, I created you! <laughs> Not Thaddeus Rockwell. There was just one other thing that I wanted to, to, to talk about because in this section here, he names drops an episode called smooth sailing which shush thinks her muddlefoot is a master spy and i think that got changed to the merchant of menace i think so too because 
I think Smooth Sailing is a fantastic name. <laughs> but Merchant of Menace is also a really fantastic name, so I can't fault him there. And then he <laughs> ends off this paragraph. It's just basically giving examples of what happens in the episode and how the the title should coincide with it. And in the episode, Dead Duck, dot, 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 he dies. <laughs> he does. He does indeed. So, yeah. So now talk about the plot. I liked that they they made a point of really driving home what makes the show. They talk about how the series is really about a specific individual and the people in his life, how he deals with life's obstacles and surprises and creates humorous and warm stories. The fact this individual happens to be a superhero takes the stories to extremes. And then they say, personality humor is what drives Darkwing Duck. And that the most important word in Darkwing Duck is caricature. And I thought that was all very interesting because that is very much... Because Darkwing Duck is a show with superheroes, but it isn't, mm -hmm. it isn't quite what the show is about. It's like it's there as a symptom of his life. But what you're really invested in is the relationship between him and Goslin and, you know, all these other characters and how they interact with one another. And I think that's why this show is so popular. One of the more popular Disney afternoon shows, I would say. Not at all biased. But because <laughs> it's true. Because, like, when you watch any other superhero themed show that does focus more on the superheroing it has a different vibe yeah it's not focusing so much as the character as he is domestically as well as super powery it just kind of this i feel like has a very good balance between those two there are certain episodes where it's strictly darkwing but it never it's never just darkwing as a character it's darkwing and the people that he chooses to be around or the people who come into his crosshairs that it's still drake mallard under all of it and how he reacts to it and poorly he handles things <laughs> but also in there too I, I i noticed that he says these are not detective stories it just kind of like this is not gonna be some big mystery show darkwing even though he thinks he's hot shit don't make him batman basically and also don't go sappy on us. We can have our warm feelings. We can have our lovely moments, but don't go sappy. <laughs> and I think they did a good job with that. There was never really a point where I was like, oh, this is too soft and sappy. It was usually the mm -hmm. right the right amount. Yeah, yeah, it was good. So we try to keep a sense of reality in the show. Crazy, far-fetched reality, but reality nonetheless. And it's like if you develop an outline for an episode filled with battles, you'll learn that you usually run out of gags after the first two face-offs. Because, as we see time and time again in these episodes, the actual fighting is just basically really awkward animation, or just the staple dust cloud with limbs popping out of it every <laughs> once in a while. Like, this is not your, your superhero show where you're gonna get 15-minute fight scenes with super high rates of animation. It's just... And then Darkwing does a really awkward sweep kick and Negaduck jumps over it. <laughs> he kicks someone who's really muscular or strong and just shatters into a million pieces. <laughs> yes. So then I think it, it serves the show that way too. I mean, sometimes I do wish that the battles would be a little bit more because you do build up all episode to this great big showdown. And then it usually boils down to either just one well-placed kick or an environmental thing that thwarts the bad guy. Negaduck falling but... down a flight of <laughs> stairs. <laughs> As the way he's defeated in one episode was so good. <laughs> it kind of, it kind of, I guess, takes the wind out of its own sails. Because it's like, oh, this is the big... Th no, he just falls down the stairs. And you're like, oh, you. <laughs> and it's extended for, like, a full, like, 30 seconds of him falling. <laughs> Great. So then after that, we move on to the, the vehicles and the gadgets. And uh, he talks about how the Thunderquack gets into Darkwing Tower. 
Arctic. It enters the secret headquarters by crashing into the waters of the Audubon Bay. It travels submerged to the base of the suspension bridge where doors slide open to admit it. We've Which, never seen that. I think it happens in Darkly Dawn's The Duck. I thought no. that was the rat no, catcher. No, that, that was the rat catcher. Yes, because he drives that. Because then the next sentence in this is Launchpad always pilots the Thunder Quack. Mm -hmm. And then we do have the rat catcher here, which he refers to as his earth stomping street machine. <laughs> and then it can also apparently be re controlled by remote control or voice commands. And didn't, if we have it, they didn't guess. lean into that a whole lot. No, and it kind of is like the Swiss army knife of gadgets because it can be anything that he needs it to be, basically. Oh, I had this, you know, super specific radar installed on the rack catcher. Why do I need a raisin finder? Well, for this very moment, you sometimes you need to avoid them or go straight toward them because some people like raisins. I will not accept that. <laughs> And then we have the, the gas gun, which it doesn't name. It just says, suck gas, evildoer. Usually it doesn't buy him much of an advantage. Remember, in all cases, it's not the gimmick, it's the guy. So it's basically saying that it, it shouldn't be helpful to him. It just should be him making something very useful, not useful at all, by doing the wrong thing and making things harder for him, not easier. And then he uses the term cartoon license to, you know, say that, things that he thinks are clever should definitely just be completely absurd and he gives another little scenario of Darkwing Duck using a Bic lighter as a, a welding torch <laughs> and of course it blows him up and he goes flying through a wall and he gives two different scenarios of how it could end depending on the amount of time that they have in the episode to play out the gag and I think the first, the first one made me laugh because it's Pan over to Launchpad, who is peering through a Darkwing Duck-shaped hole in the metal. He's very impressed. <laughs> Launchpad, way to go, Darkwing. The crooks would never expect you to go out the back way. Which I feel like is the version that we usually get. Yes. Because I feel like Launchpad says a lot of stuff like that. And then the, the second one is just, you know, the, the Darkwing mugging to the fourth wall. Where he, you know, like, meant for that to happen. And uh, then, of course, something immediately thwarts him. But now we are on to the good stuff here. The rest of that, except for the Muddlefoots, is garbage. <laughs> garbage, you hear me. As we're on to the Darkwing Duck's rogue gallery. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The heroism of a man is measured by the strength of the opponents he overcomes. Which I thought was a very prolific statement there. Especially considering who, <laughs> who this rogue gallery is. Yes. Uh, our first, our first up on the chopping block is Bushroot, where he basically just rakes him over the coals, saying that Bushroot's a terrible villain. He's terrible at being a villain. He's got low self-esteem. He's a victim of peer pressure and the fearsome five. And then he goes on to say that he's practically immortal. No matter how he gets sliced, diced, mulched, or wilted, there's always some root tuber or cutting that manages to replant itself and grow back into a familiar Bushroot. It implies that he is probably one of the stronger villains, but he just doesn't have the backbone to use his powers in a way that would actually be truly threatening. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting, because when Negaduck steals his powers, Negaduck proved that point, that someone else with those powers who is far more evil would probably do very terrible things. So Yeah. Also goes on about how he's just not normally plotting evil things, but he'll never, like, if he sees an opportunity, he'll take it. And he calls him a coward at some point, so what's shrewd. And yet he still has the highest body count. Imagine if he actually used his powers for evil, how high that body count would be. Right, like, if he actually tried? Good lord. So that's our little section there on Bushroot, and then it has Bushroot appears in and lists a bunch of episodes. And then we have good old Megavolt. Yeah. This picture's pretty cute. It's not one that I, I normally see. He's kind of in a weird stance there. He looks like he's looking down at his name like, what does that say? Although I didn't really have too much to, to take away from here. It's basically just describing Megavolt as, as we all know and love him. Although he, he'd be pretty scary if his power trips hadn't fried his brain a long time ago. I like that confirmation because I have seen that as a fan theory that the reason he has such a bad memory is because of his powers and the side mm -hmm. effects of those powers. And that's basically just been confirmed. Yeah. 
And then it closes out with saying, when he's operating with the Fearsome Five, he feels a special kinship with Quacker Jack, who is just as crazy as he is. And that's a good, that's a good quality in Friends. That's how I choose the ones that stay around. Me too. And then we, hey, crazy together. <laughs> uh, then we have Tusker Nini, who I always say, oh, what's this episode? And then I put it on and it turns out to be a Tusker Nini episode. And I'm like, oh, okay. I don't really have very strong feelings about Tusker Nini. But I thought it was interesting because he does point that out in here. He calls him the most flamboyant of all of Darkwing Duck's villains, which, true. But Tusker Nini is useful as a generic villain because although his MO is interesting, it needn't upstage a strong personal story about one of our regular characters. Huh. And that kind of brings it back to the point about the plot not really being about the villains. It's about... Darkwing and his relationships and Tusker mm -hmm. Nini is just another way to set that all up. I think it also, it, the character specifically, it kind of, you know, like he says, this is M.O. that he's acting. So even when he's himself, he can be in any situation and he could be the villain of the episode because he could just pre be pretending to be anything. So he's versatile and flexible plot wise. Also, his... the weird origin story that he was actually a literal starving artist in his youth. And then he <laughs> got, I guess he made money later in life and got fat from eating a lot. Yeah, he ate himself out of every roll. So, bat jokes. Honker is immune. No one else is safe. And then we have everyone's, the darling of everyone's hearts, Quacker Jack, who is described as the most colorful foe. Which... I guess so. He has a lot of patterns and stuff going on. But on the whole, I think that the Darkwing villains are very colorful. They're a very colorful bunch. Mm -hmm. And they do look nice together. Like when all the five are together, they're like nobody kind of melts into any, like, you know, they don't kind of get lost with each other. They're all very dynamic in their own character designs. And it says Quacker Jack was once the head of a toy company that was pushed out of business by the video game fad. So here we are 30 years later video game fad still going it's now one of the most profitable businesses on the planet so he's blames video games for getting him out of business but it also says the fact that his toy soldiers fired real guns and his teddy bears had an appetite for poodles didn't help the sales either <laughs> uh so poodles specifically so if you just had like a little mutt or a puggle or a pug and german shepherd fine poodle Iron Horror, baby. And then he refers to Mr. Banana Brain as a ventriloquist puppet. I guess he kind of is in the sense that he speaks through him. Yeah. And I feel like there are certain times where Mr. Banana Brain shows some kind of visual reaction. Uh, not just in the paddy whack situation. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I just kind of was like, ooh. Does that mean that, does that, mean that he shoves his hand into Mr. Banana Brain? I don't like that. <laughs> Also, Mr. Banana Brain is, is a creepy looking thing. I don't care for him. He's dressed like Bart Simpson and uh, he's got weird teeth. Didn't I say in one episode previous that he reminds me of Sideshow Bob? You did, but that was Life the Negaverse and everything, which, listeners, will probably be the next episode that you hear. But we are beyond time and space and we'll be hearing this episode first. So, be laugh really loud. When Ange says that in the life <laughs> universe. Because <laughs> she's she's right. She's very right. He does look like Sideshow Pop. The Fearsome Five and especially enjoys the company of his insane compadre, Megavolt. And then it lists all of his episodes. Well, some of his episodes. And we go on to Steelbeak after that. And he doesn't, I don't really feel like he has a lot to say about Steelbeak. I didn't like Steelbeak's uh, description for several reasons, which I'm sure you will get into. Yeah, he, he calls him a sleazy personality of a pickup artist. He's usually following somebody else's plan uh, just because he doesn't care. And uh, he uses the Eggman as much as he wants to do the grunt work. And he says, as the Imperial Stormtroopers were to Darth Vader, so are the Eggmen to Steelbeak. I don't know what okay. pickup artists were like in the 90s, but they are horrifying nowadays so like imagining steelbeak <laughs> as like a pickup artist guru is just like the most horrifying thing ever yeah and i mean he is a little bit but he did have like know. a shoot to dispose of 
women that ladies <laughs> ladies that were like sitting in his lap and he just like opens the chute and dumps them down it when he's done with them <sighs> seal beak is okay i he's not my favorite he's certainly not my least favorite but i don't really know i don't have too many super strong feelings about the guy i feel like he's a defective villain i feel especially considering uh the route that they took him in in the ducktales reboot i feel like he is a far more formidable foe in the original series where ducktales 2017 he's more bumbling and launch pad in a suit after steelbeak we have the liquidator who is spectacular i love the liquidator i feel and... like the liquidator was like the least popular of the fearsome five but he's getting his love now in modern day i feel like he's become more popular among fans than he used to be yeah, especially during the um, the Darkwing Duck OC month, I did see a few Blood Flood adjacent characters, and I'm like, good, yeah, give him some love. But yeah, I and then he just kind of goes into how the Liquidator became the Liquidator, and he seems pretty overpowered too, probably not to the extent that Bushroot is, but did li we get the impression that the Liquidator could be truly a nightmare? If he wasn't, you know, the liquidator, it's just his personality. He's just a super salesman and he speaks in advertising lingo. When running away, he might say four to five dentists pulled, say, let's get the floss out of here. I'm going to say that from <laughs> now on. I like that. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, he's he's great. And I, I truly, I truly love him. But then the ending part of that is he gets on the nerves of the other members of the Fearsome Five because he's so up all the time. You don't really get a chance to see much Fearsome Five personality dynamics aside from Jailbird, honestly. Yeah, because even in Justice Ducks, they're partnered off. Yeah, and there's maybe like one scene where they're fighting with each other, but otherwise you don't really get to see a whole lot of this, which is a shame because I really do like the Fearsome Five dynamics. I could see him being a lot for, you know, Megavolt particularly. So yeah, and then there's very few. I feel like this must be just the episodes that were produced when he revised the Bible because that is certainly not all the Liquidator episodes. And then we have your man, the love of your tiny black heart, Negaduck, and he is in that iconic Negaduck pose of him just doubled over, seething furiously. Looks like he's got the two different colored eyes and everything. He gets his little intro here. When it comes to arch enemies and nemesis is... Nemesis? Nemesis. Darkwing's archest and nemesisist. <laughs> yeah, like, I don't even feel like that's a real word. Is Negaduck. His origin is sketchy. We keep changing it whenever we get a new idea. But his character is clear-cut. He represents the worst in all of us. Saying that he plays Mr. Hyde to Darkwing's Dr. Jekyll. And he hates everything that is sweet and good. Cliché animated villains are merely evil for the sake of being evil. But although this is true of Negaduck, the fun is carrying it to extremes. Which we wholeheartedly agree. Because he is not only tying the damsel to the train track, he is also somehow driving the train. <laughs> And then climbing out on the front of the train and putting a battering ram and five miles of barbed wire out in front of it to get to that damsel faster. He is a bitch with no chill. <laughs> he certainly, certainly is. And it goes on to tell us that Negada formed the Fearsome Five. And although he has no powers or gimmicks, he keeps them in line with the sheer power of his personality. He constantly treats them unfairly. Inspiring plots of mutiny, which are doomed to failure. And then they're just like, he, he looks just like Darkwing. <laughs> Not much to say about him, because I guess you know, there really isn't much when you don't have anything nailed down. Just basically, this is Negadek. He's the worst. These are his colors. Everyone hates him. And then we have... <laughs> so I want to make sure that you have your moment here. If you have anything to say about him, he got more lines than Binky, but not by much. He is... He is, in my opinion, one of the better cartoon villains, even though he is not very, you know, he's not like an onion with all those layers <laughs> you can peel back. He is what he is, like what you see is what you get with him. But I'm glad they acknowledge in the 
Bible that the whole point of him is to take him to extremes because that's the whole thing that I always used to say is that the whole reason I like him is because he always looks like he's having so much fun being evil and he makes being (laughs) evil look fun and that's like why he's fun to watch on TV because like you said he's just he goes all out he's just ridiculous he has no shame he will do whatever it takes to you know crush everybody's day even if it involves dressing up in a giant adult diaper and putting on a bonnet he, he's very committed and but you're right he does he has the best time doing all of it one thing that and it's just it can be as petty as he wants it to be it doesn't even have to have this giant end game like in my valentine ghoul where he's trying to steal morgana away like he does have an end game there but Specifically, when he is sobbing on her couch, trying to get her to feel sorry for him. But we have to know that he's joking, or not serious anyway, that he's not genuine about it. He's just, oh, oh, oh. And then he goes, hey, hey, hey. like, he <laughs> this little evil laugh in the mid, all the crying, and it's just so funny. <laughs> oh, well, of course I trust you. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> you don't know how much this means to me. He's, I think, one of the funniest characters on the show. And there are a lot of funny characters on the show, but everything that he does is just pitch perfect. He's just so out there, and he is a great, I think, foil to Darkwing, who's also super flamboyant and super dramatic, but they're just in different ways that make them clash even better. It's true. I was going to quote my Valentine Ghoul, too, for my favorite Negaduck moments, because there's the part where he freezes Morgana in the ice cube, and then he's pulling her out, and he drops a pun. He's like, Oh, don't worry, Morgana. You'll warm up to me. I'll warm up. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> he's talking to himself, technically, because she's frozen, and he's just <laughs> losing it. And I just, I don't know, I, it gets me every single time I watch it. You gotta love a villain that laughs at his own joke. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he is he is fantastic. He's definitely uh, I don't know. I really love Megavolt, but Negaduck might be my, my favorite. It changes, I feel like, depending on the week. <laughs> um and then there's a section about Moliarty. But I don't particularly care about Moliarty. So if you would like to talk about Moliarty, we can. I might have actually glossed over it. I don't think I read it in great detail. I did. It's just basically saying, this is Moliarty. He's a mole. He thinks he's very smart, and he thinks he's very handsome, but he's a mole. (laughs) And they only have a listed in two episodes, and I feel like that's probably pretty accurate. And then we have Ammonia Pine, who is a top foul agent, which makes me really question the screening and vetting (laughs) that they do. (laughs) <laughs> at foul that ammonia pine is considered a top agent she apparently got her, turned evil by inhaling an ins- experimental toilet disinfectant so it would seem see i i do not even know the last time i watched an ammonia pine episode that we get that origin story but it checks out but yeah she's basically just a clean freak and she looks very angry in this little picture I find she's pretty funny, but she, in terms of plot potential, I feel like she's a little more narrow on what you can do with her because it's essentially the same thing is that she's just, she Mm -hmm. absolutely hates anything dirty. She's a clean freak. Everything has to be cleaned up. So any episode you do with her, you'd have to run with the same kind of theme of dirt related stuff and her cleaning up and I can see why they wouldn't use her a whole lot after a while but I thought she was actually quite funny I liked her sister too ample grime yeah they're really good at naming characters whoever came up with these names if it was a group effort or whatever uh, I tip my hat to you but yeah she's definitely very pigeonholed into her obsession she's no Tuscanini that's for sure. But I am I feel like I should just hand it off to you now because we have heroic guest stars. And the first that we uh, get to highlight here is one of Angie's favorites. <laughs> uh, but we'll, we'll talk a bit about what they have to say about Darkwing and his ability to play well with others. 
Darkwing begins thinking that he's better than the other guy and ends up looking really stupid, which is absolutely the case. And then he, they talk about the Justice Ducks. And although they seem like a powerful team on the surface, their personalities get in the way. Which is true, because they're not a very cohesive team that have too much ego or not enough focus or just blatant, I can't think of a nicer way to say stupidity, <coughs> stigma. <coughs> that I don't think that they would even ever team up again after this, unless it was forced upon them. I think if you actually look at the episode, they're only actually together as the Just Ducks for like a full minute because they mm. don't form until the very end. There's a very quick fight and then it ends. It does. They don't really all team up and do it together. It's just kind of like, I feel like it's a bit of a Scooby-Doo where certain folks pair off and a lot of running past the camera and stuff it's been a while since i watched that one too but i do like that one but yeah so now that we got out of the way we i will pass it on to you angie so that you can discuss your truest love you're of course talking about gizmo duck right no he's the last one in this book the first is raisin enthusiast comic guy is he a raisin wrote... enthusiast or did you just make that up i just made it up <laughs> so, so that you hate him further <laughs> I, just, I was highlighting certain parts of this, and I just wrote real big in highlighter next to it. That's his name. No. <laughs> I, I did not. Want, I did read the whole thing. I only highlighted that he wears a tiny spaceship as a hat. <laughs> I can't even tell you the last time I watched a Comic Guy episode because I did not like him that much. And that his battle cry was a, ha 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 <laughs> And uh, yeah, so Comic Guy. It's just, I, it kind of kills me that he's the first one. Yeah, I thought that was actually pretty funny that he shows up first above all the other characters. I mean, and it just, everybody else is better. And it's not even like he appears first because his episode numbers are later than I think everybody else's. So maybe Tad was just super jazzed about Comic Guy. Like he's going to get his own spin off show. It's just, he's basically super ridiculous. And I just want to say intensely unlikable. Maybe they just wanted to, like, rip the Band-Aid off really fast and get through him so we could get to the good stuff. I don't know. He actually had a pretty long little bio, yeah. too. Like, it was pretty lengthy. He had a, a lot to say about him and where he came from. And, like, he feels like a pitch for another show. Like, this was a character that was made that didn't get his own show. And they said, well, we'll just repurpose him and put him in here. Especially the fact that he's a human. <laughs> like, why of all things would you put a human superhero in Darkwing Duck? But it is pretty funny that, you know, he comes from a planet full of superheroes. And there's no bad guys around, so he has to leave to try to find some skulls to crack. But his weaknesses, when they're talking about, like, whenever he hears a bell, he has to dance. And he can't stop until he hears a whistle. It's just like... How was this character supposed to be in more than two episodes? <laughs> like, with such nuanced, super weird... I don't... I just don't... He confuses me. I have only one quote that I highlighted, and it is, Darkwing's willingness to help Comet Guy stems primarily from his respect for Comet Guy's goals, the obliteration of evil... And from his fear that if Comet Guy is left unsupervised, he might accidentally wipe out the planet. It is a very real fear. It's a fair I can really see it happening. I can see it happening. Comet Guy. We're going to change this to a Comet Guy podcast. <laughs> or we're just going to watch the same Comet Guy episodes over and over and over again. Until we learn to appreciate him. As much as whoever puts a show bible together and decided that he deserved to go first in the list of Darkwing's allies. But, in my opinion, one of the finest of Darkwing's allies is next. And it is our witchy queen, Morgana Macabre. She's just, I just love her so much. She's great. And she's just such a strange addition to the team, too. Where there really isn't any other magic users until she shows up. And then they just kind of keep holding little things in here and there. Especially when we get to meet her family and all that, but he describes her as being creepy by nature in a Charles Adams sense. 
When asked to think of pleasant thoughts, she dreams of foggy nights in a graveyard or the way the moon gleams off a polished skull. And then she, he talks about how she's so self-conscious and then how that messes up her magic. Goslin thinks she's the greatest because anybody who looks a giant spider perch on her shoulder, bats live in her hair, is A1 in her book. And then it ends off with a special note right next to it I wrote in giant letters and highlighter. Why? <laughs> Because it says, Morgana first appears in the episode of Fungus Among Us as the head of a ghoulish board of directors who turned out to be mushrooms. She was very domineering except for the fact that she let Fungus tell her how to run her business. That script should not be used as a guide to her personality. And I think that that's my favorite Morgana episode. Because she seems to be the most thought out personality wise in that episode. Because she isn't just fitting the role of insecure girlfriend and being super jealous at the drop of a hat and turning him into weird creatures because he's, you know, he's Darkwing. I feel like if we had a consistent characterization of Morgana that was more like Fungus Among Us, A+. Plus. Morgana Macabre is written inconsistently in just about every episode. Her personality is different in each one, which as a result leads to all kinds of chaos in terms of how she is represented in, as a character. In this essay, I will. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously though, I could write an entire essay about her and how her personality is inconsistent throughout the entire... She only appears in like nine episodes, and each one, she's a little bit different. Like, there's a couple where she's more short-tempered and very hysteric and more of the classic woman who is too emotional and zaps Darkwing at the slightest issue. Especially My Valentine Ghoul. They really played it up in that one, I think, because the whole point of the episode was that they were having relationship issues. But then in Justice, Justice Ducks, she's more insecure and self-conscious and more like, ooh, I, I hope he still likes me. Like sh she's putting up with more of his garbage. Yeah. And then other episodes, she has more of uh, a mischievous bad girl vibe, especially her villain episodes. And then, of course, mm -hmm. Fungus Among Us, she's more like a, a professional, like a real beautiful businesswoman who is clearly up to something but she's gorgeous and mysterious and she's captured Darkwing's interest from the very get-go it's just different every single time and I think that's why she probably isn't the most popular character and especially as a love interest for Darkwing people do not like her that much often but I love Morgana I am a huge fan I think she is wonderful. I hope she returns for the Darkwing Duck reboot. I am here for her. Same. I do love me some Morgana. But also in Fungus Among Us, she is definitely the more most confident and competent in her skills, which is completely thrown out the window in every other episode. Or I guess she was too competent <laughs> to, to, to roll with this crew because she wasn't, you know, accidentally turning people into pudding. I would have loved to to have her be more consistent because she definitely does just go, you know, like the opposite of the Binky and her route where they were very compatible, whereas Morgana is just kind of not great. I mean, he is definitely super awful to her, but she also just has like the, the shrewish kind of tropey insecure girlfriend thing going on. In some of the episodes that bums me out because she deserved better we also deserved her action figure <laughs> <laughs> yes that never came out and in that same line was also a quacker jack which is also a bummer because he would have been a cool one to have too but yeah we are a morgana macabre appreciation zone we do enjoy us some morgana i love how she brings all of the supernatural elements to the world I just love how it introduces the concept of monsters and their own society. And they basically did Harry Potter before Harry Potter in the sense that they had a magic school where people go and they study magic. I just, I love all of that. And I think there's just so much to explore in that world that there's so much story potential that you can pull out of that at any time that you want 
to do some kind of story or like, well, what if they end up in another world or another dimension or this or that happens? You can use like the magic aspect of all of that. Like she's just, I feel like it was a shame she only appeared in nine episodes. And I also think it's a shame that she's often excluded from the family dynamic both in the show and by fans at large. She tends to be seen as an outsider. And I think there's a lot of potential there for her to be more than that. She just had to be written properly. And I don't mean to insult the writers because, you know, the writers are all really great. And, you know, I enjoy a lot of the show and the writing. But she was definitely like a sticking point for me. And she is interesting, too, because she is intelligent. Like, she definitely has the chops where she gives a presentation at the the wizarding school. And she is only evil because she needs to pay off her student loans. Like, there's so many interesting things about her that just kind of get overshadowed by the inconsistency of her emotional outbursts and all that jazz. Yeah, so that's our little segment on Morgana. It does not mention if she has legs or if she has feet. (laughs) She could have anything under there. The debate for the centuries. Yes. And then we have the other two members of the Justice Ducks, who are not ducks. We have Stegmut, who is... He's Stegmut. In uh, the notes here, it talks about when he became... A dinosaur he says so when his brain became walnut sized it was actually a more comfortable fit just basically saying that he was super dumb to begin with and now he had a reason to be super dumb because his brain shrunk <laughs> segment is a special friend to goslin and loves being included in the justice ducks that is one thing that i think is cute is that him and goslin are always like super excited to see each other i do like that in justice justice ducks when she's like Stigma! goslin it's yeah, like cute. the same level of enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> so there's Stigma. And then we have Neptunia, who is pretty cool. She, again, she, in a, a nicer shade of, of comic eye, doesn't really feel like she belongs in this show. Like She seems like she should have her own show, where she was a fish that apparently got mutated by illegally dumped toxic waste. And that mentions that she's goslin-sized, which is a good indicator. She's very tiny. And her name was originally written as Nepetunia. Oh, it is. It does say that right there. In the earlier script. Nepetunia. Yeah, and then I guess they changed it. I guess so. It could be Petunia. Nepetunia. Anyway. Her gruff exterior hides the traditional warm heart. Darkwing brings out her sarcastic streak. And she is very sassy. I do like that about her. She doesn't put up with Uh, Darkwing's bullshit. Or his insults or his rudeness. I also like how just blunt she is sometimes, especially with her little octopus guy, Hal. Yeah. Like, I need you to do something for me, Hal. <laughs> like she's a dispatcher working at a trucker stop or something. And she says, although she's a charter member of the superhero group, the Justice Duck, she hates the name because she's not and never has been a duck. I think that's fair. It is fair. It's fish it is erasure. Fair. It is. How dare they? And then... We are on the last page. Even the best for last. It's everyone's favorite is Modoc. Who is the gallant hero who fights for truth, justice, and the Duckburgian way? Who hits the talk show circuit as the darling of law enforcement set? Blabbering, bladder skite, it's Gizmodoc. And then I feel like it's just like. And then the next line is, and it drives Darkwing Duck crazy. (laughs) (laughs) And then he talks about how everybody loves Gizmo Duck and that the police think he's great. And those same police think that Darkwing's had a stupid. He he drops the Dudley Do-Right characterization in here quite a bit as a, this character is kind of like a Dudley Do-Right or this character is not like a Dudley Do-Right. Gizmo Duck is definitely, he is an armored Dudley Do-Right. And his real identity is Fenton Crackshell, who Launchpad considers an old friend. And he does say in here, he is still based in Duckburg, but we make no specific reference to Job other than being Duckburg's superhero. So this is still just kind of solidifying not the same universe as DuckTales. So 
this Fenton might not necessarily be or have the same backstory that the uh, Fenton of DuckTales had. But one thing that I did notice, or have noticed, I always notice Gizmoduck. I love Gizmoduck. Is that his armor and his gizmos, if you will, are silly, sillier in this one, but also like playing to the Darkwing Duck rules where they'll just be, you know, like straight up weapons. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, you know, he mentions in here like tennis rackets and skunks that could just whip out of the different panels on his suit at any time. And uh, he doesn't really super go into how much. Darkwing hates him, <laughs> which I think is the funniest dynamic. It doesn't really go into that Gizmoduck does not hate Darkwing at all. I mean, Tiff of the Titans, he's suspicious of him. He does think that he is the villain, so he is, you know, grandstanding and trying to take him in. But then after that, it's just like, we are best friends, <laughs> which is fantastic, and I love it so much. <sighs> Gizmoduck, my love. When we get to a Gizmo Deck episode, I will let you go off. I did actually write an essay once defending Gizmo Duck <laughs> to <laughs> Darkwing Duck fans. It was uh, because, especially the way that he is portrayed in Darkwing Duck, he, if you're not a f familiar with character as he was in DuckTales, I feel like he's a lot more sympathetic in DuckTales because you do get to know the vent and crack shell side of Gizmo Duck and you know how. That molds who his superhero persona is. And in DuckTales, he's purely there to annoy Darkwing. It's the only purpose he has, which is hysterical. But it also, I could see why people wouldn't like him because there was a time when it seemed like nobody liked Gizmo Duck. And I was like, but why? I didn't initially like him, and then I came to like him. I came to appreciate him for who he is and that he is genuinely funny and nice and makes a really good addition just because he's a good contrast to Darkwing and the definition of what a hero is. Yeah. And I like that he also, he can be hurt by what Darkwing says and what he does. But at the end of the day, he's not going to bow to him. Mm -hmm. So specifically in Justice, Justice Ducks, when Darkwing is just being a volatile volcano of ego he chases off everybody else and Gizmo Duck is still there and he's like, I'm not here for you. I'm here to stop the bad guys. So, all right, bye. <laughs> I'm gonna go do that now. <laughs> he's just, I don't know. I just love Gizmo Duck. It makes me laugh. And it's also Hamilton Camp's delivery of what he says. His voice is just so over the top heroic and it's just so funny. And then Little Fenton is so like nerdy and it just tickled me. I just love him. See, now a different show entirely would be if Fenton Crackshell moved in next door to the Muddlefoots. On the other side, so Drake is surrounded. <gasps> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I would totally be there for that. Drake would probably, I don't know, he'd be hitting the, the vodka with Grizzly Cough, probably. <laughs> yeah, he's the last page. I don't know if there's supposed to be more pages. It, I, I can't remember if it's numbered, if it says how many pages to expect or if there's an index. So we can only assume so, it ends there and there's nothing else. Yeah. Pretty interesting. It's it's kind of comprehensive. It's definitely the, the outline of basically this is how to Darkwing. And it's, it's fun. It's fun to look at this and see what they were given to create some of the episodes that we love the most. They had a list of the episodes, and some of them had different names before they renamed them. So I compiled the list of all the different ones because okay. I thought they were interesting. And they are A Bushroot Christmas. Oh, that's it. It's a wonderful leaf. Justice Ducks for All. Just Us, Justice Ducks. Justice Ducks, yeah. Comic Book Classic. Oh. I think that's Comic, comic Book Capers. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's Comic Book Capers. Reverse Universe Story. I guess that's life, the negaverse, and everything. Yes. Toying with disaster. Oh, uh, Toys R Us, probably. Yeah, probably one of the, the toy-related ones. Medieval Story. <laughs> <laughs> well, Medieval Story is probably Inherit the Wimp? No. Quack of Ages. There's, 
quack of ages. I always, I always wanted to be inherit the wimp, but that's not. I feel like there is like a medievally kind of relative in inherit the wimp. There which is. is why my brain keeps like a Don Quixote kind of dude. And then the last one is a Darkwing Valentine. Oh, my Valentine ghoul. So you can tell they just kind of like temporarily slap those in. They're like, eh, we'll change them later. But I think toying with disaster could actually still be used potentially for something. Yeah, it's a good one. I think it's a good one. And I mean, I guess Toys R Us is effective too. I don't know that it's better though. I don't know. Just like smooth sailing. <laughs> That was fun. I didn't even notice that. I was uh, except for the smooth sailing because it was in. I just skimmed over the episode titles, but I didn't even recognize that. So reverse universe story is that what it is? Yep. Yeah. So thank you guys for joining us for this episode of the reverse universe story Bible, and the Darkwing will... Duck Bible King mm -hmm. Herb Muddlefoot edition. <laughs> We have come to the two hour mark, by the way. So when I edit this, it'll probably be like a full hour and 30 minutes. Nice. <laughs> a lot to say. It's a special episode. It is because um, Darkwing Duck now turns how old? 30. 30 years. 30 years old. My God. And you know that when you're 30, you've become a dried up husk. And you have to be shipped off the planet to where all the old people go because you are no longer useful to society. I mean, that's why I'm recording this in my shipping container right now. <laughs> I don't even know where I am in the universe. I feel like I'll probably get to my destination soon, but it is very cold in space and no one can hear me scream. It's true. Are you going to celebrate or do anything special on this day? I will probably forget about it and then feel guilty. <laughs> I might. I actually might watch uh, Justice Justice Ducks or one of the one of the ones that I really like. I'm wondering. I don't know if they will do it, but I'm wondering if they'll have any reboot announcements in celebration of his thirtieth. I feel like mm. they would have to have really planned and stuck close to whatever they have come up with for the show would have to be ready by this date in order for them to announce it properly. So I don't know if they could actually pull that off depending on, cause you know, stuff in the animation industry, things change all the time, the drop of a dime. So you can't necessarily follow anniversary dates and stuff like that. But I think it would be cool if they dropped a hint or something neat. Or maybe like some kind of merch, something like that. I did see that they, Disney in general, has put out some new pins that are coming out with like the villains and the heroes of various Disney properties. And there's Negaduck, Darkwing, and Megavolt, I think, are a few of them. Mm -hmm. But they're like those blind bags. And Kitty, as you know, with your experience, <laughs> going to Toys R Us and poking and feeling up all the blind bags so that you could find what you were looking for. I was looking specifically for Darkwing, Negaduck, Fenton, and Gizmoduck. And you know who found all those? By crinkling all those little, they were like little Funko keychain things. But you know who wound up with Fenton Gragshell? Me. All right? <laughs> but I was thinking about that because um, I don't even know if these pins are going to be in the store. But if somebody really wanted one of those and I could find them in a store, I would fill out a bag. I would do it. I would have no shame. I would stare poor sap that works in retail, just wanting to get out of that store. I would look them dead in the eyes and poke and prod every square inch of that bag. <laughs> just, just for the people who deserve it. Blind bags are just evil. Like it is truly, it, it only benefits two people. It benefits the people selling it because everybody will keep buying it until they get what they want. And it benefits the scalpers who eventually find what everybody wants and then they sell it for like a ridiculously high price on eBay. Yeah, like the little mystery Funko things that they did that were in boxes. So they thwarted my method of Morgana. There was one little Morgana in there and I don't think I've ever seen her on eBay for less than $40. I tried to buy a few of them and they're not cheap. Here in Canada, I think it was like $8 a box for one of those. And I bought a couple of them and I got like three Magicka Dispels and I was just like, <laughs> I can't do this. <laughs> uh, for, for those of you not in the know, Magicka Dispel is up there with Comic Guy of Ange's favorite Disney. I mean, in the original DuckTales 1987, I don't 
hate her with a passion, but I don't like her a whole lot. Like, she's just not one of my favorites. I'm, I don't know. I just, it's complicated. I have a complicated relationship with Magicka Dispel. <laughs> You're certainly not an appreciator of her that you need three little Funko Pops of her. Precisely. <laughs> okay, so that's it. We have now finished our sermon from the Dark Wing Duck Bible. May you go in peace and dangerously. I remember that crime doesn't sleep, and neither do we. Amen. Good night, everybody.